76ers eke out with a win last night in uh, a very interesting game as it played out. And to get more into the game as we saw it last night is our 76ers insider, Paul Hudrick. You can follow him on Twitter at Paul Hudrick. And you can check out his latest article on 973ESB.com with his takeaways. He was in the house for the game last night. Paul, how you doing today? I'm great, Josh. How are you, man? Doing pretty good. So I'm going to start off with you where I kind of started off with the beginning of the show, which is I'm, I'm conflicted because I'm not sure. Did the Sixers really win that game last night or did Washington lose that game last night? I'm going to say the Sixers won that game. Um, cause, I mean, I'll, I'll start with this. If you expected them to, if like you expected Doc Rivers to just have a magic wand and make everything work with two preseason games, one where Joel Embiid didn't even play, and, and in a shortened training camp where he had two guys that are rotation players, you know, start training camp with COVID, with Danny Green less than two months removed from a championship. Like if you if you expected this thing to just hum from the beginning. Like you are, I don't know, either you're a really big optimist or you just you, you just didn't read the situation well. Like it, it was, it was going to be ugly to start, and it was, um, at, at least from the starter's perspective. The bench came in and, and, and provided a nice little spark, and I think that speaks to more of more of those guys playing together, right? When you look at Shake Milton, when you look at Furkan Korkmaz, Mike Scott, like those guys have played together before, so I think that's part of it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would say if, you know, I'll, I'm encouraged by the fourth quarter because I think the, the third quarter was some of the worst offensive basketball I've ever watched in that building. Um, and I've watched some bad offensive basketball in that building, but the fourth quarter was just so impressive the way Joel and B took it over. Even Ben Simmons defensively, the way he took over down the stretch. Um, I, I, I'm more encouraged again than I am discouraged by what I saw because I thought they did what they had to do in the fourth quarter to come away with a win and, and a game that looked like it was getting away from them. You mentioned that third quarter. They scored 15 total points. They didn't get their first bucket until halfway through. They had 10 straight misses. So what went wrong? What, what was the problem in those half-court sets? They just looked completely lost. It looked like the offense looked like, hey, get the ball to Joel and beat in the post. And then, you know, and then, and then they didn't really seem like they had a plan after that. Uh, it looked like a lot. It looks like a lot of standing around, which is something that Doc Rivers is not a fan of. Doc Rivers really encourages movement in his offense. You know, moving the ball, moving, and then also players moving off of it. So you didn't see a lot of that with Joel Embiid. I thought it, it just got like really stagnant. And on top of that, when they got good looks, they just flat out missed them. Um, you know, everybody did uh, in that stretch. Whether it was Tobias Harris, whether it was Danny Green, even Seth Curry, like they just they could. On top of just having of a bad offense, of a stagnant offense. They just couldn't make a shot. So I think it was it was just a, a bad combination of things. And it's, again, uh, to me, this was expected. I, I expected it to be clunky. I expected it to be kind of ugly from the start. Um, and if anything, I'm just really encouraged by the bench because of how great they look. Uh, but, yeah, the starters, they got some serious work to do. They got to figure a lot of things out. You mentioned the bench, and that's where I really wanted to go next, and that is you, know, you have a starting unit that had 11 turnovers. The bench had Five. You had a starting unit that had 16 fouls. The bench had nine. It just felt like the starters had no life at times, but the bench came in firing between Dwight Howard and Maxie and Milton and Mike Scott's energy. It felt like the bench was like, we're ready to go, and the starters didn't know what they were doing at times. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a number of things, I think. It's... Um, uh, you know, Danny Green, I think it's very clear he still doesn't have his legs back. You know, and, and it is a tricky situation he was in where, you know, he comes off the championship with the Lakers. Then two months later, you know, and he, he gets traded here. He, the trade isn't completed. He misses the beginning. It can't. So he just has a lot of things working against him right now. I don't, I expect him to be better. I expect him to get his legs out from under him. I think that was a big part of the issue. Um, uh, Tobias Harris is just, uh, he looks lost out there. I, I, that's, that is my biggest concern with the starting lineup is just that Tobias Harris just looks like he is in like a confidence crisis right now. And he is really struggling. And I'm, you know, you got to really hope that doc rivers can get through to him into making those quicker decisions and not be so hesitant. And then Seth Curry, I actually thought, I thought he struggled early, but I think you started to see him find his footing in the fourth quarter. You know, he started running some of those dribble handoffs with Joel and bead. That's, that's the, the, the play out of the timeout. That, that was basically the, the ceiling basket where he found Ben Simmons wide, wide open for it. So I just think it's, the starters just have, and, we're in, and when we're talking about the bench, 
Shake Milton is just is the opposite of Tobias Harris right now. He is the most confident basketball player around right now. It's ridiculous. The level he is playing at is, uh, and I'm a Shake Milton guy, and you can ask anyone that knows me. I've been a Shake Milton guy from day one, but even I am kind of blown away by how good he was last night and how good he's been leading up to this, and especially, you know, defensively, how good he was last night. And then um, I loved what I saw from Dwight Howard, man. I mean, he's, he's really active. He had 10 rebounds, a bunch of offensive rebounds. Screen setting wise, I mean, I, I don't know that they've had a better screen setter here in a really long time. And I think that's what, when you talk about what makes Maxi so good, is he's so good at, at, at dribbling and playing off of ball screens. So when you have a guy like Dwight who's so good at setting them and rolls so hard to the rim, and then a guy like Maxi can finish, it's just a really good combination. And then Quirkmaz and Mike Scott, they just got to keep hitting open shots. I mean, that's, that's all you can really ask of those two guys is, is when, they're, when they're found, they got to hit them. And they're just, those guys are in a really good groove right now. They look really good. And I, I, think it's, I think it's the individual parts are all very good, whereas with the starters, uh, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, I thought looked great. Steph, Seth Curry looked good in the fourth quarter, but the other two guys right now, I mean, they got a, they got a lot of work to do uh, to get right. They absolutely do, and I always get made fun of because I I like to value plus minus when it's warranted. And Shake Milton was plus thirty three last night, so that <laughs> clearly stood out to me. While Danny Green was minus twenty seven in eighteen minutes, but I do want to touch on Joel Embiid late. Because in the fourth quarter, they scored 40 points as a team, and he was clearly getting buckets after buckets after buckets when needed. But there was a moment with a handful of minutes left where you could tell he was a little bit defeated. He was a little bit tired. And luckily, Milton had a bucket. Seth Curry had that one-footed shot that went in. Simmons got a bucket. Essentially, Joel Embiid needed some help. And I just question... Is he going to be able to get that help every night? Is what he did sustainable? Because I worry that he's going to get beat up. He is going to get tired, and he's going to need help in some of those moments. Yeah, and that's the bottom line. Is these other guys need to step up. Because, because Joel Embiid was. He was dominant in that fourth quarter. I really like that line that Doc Rivers rolled out was just surrounding him with four shooters. I think that helped him a lot. I think it helped open up some space. Uh, and again, I, I, I what I really was encouraged by was how Seth Curry stepped up in the fourth quarter and how he looked playing off of Joel Embiid, to your point, how they really complimented each other, I thought was huge. And Seth had a couple of big floaters in the paint. Like I said, he found Ben Simmons on that uh, after timeout play. I mean, it, so I, I think it's just a matter of those guys getting more comfortable, you know, Seth Curry getting more comfortable. Again, Danny Green getting his, getting his legs together. And the, the biggest, it's funny because it's the biggest question mark on the entire roster for me is Tobias Harris. Uh, what is he going to be this year? Um, he can't be that guy that, that we saw in, in that first game. He can't. He just can't. I mean, he had a chance in the fourth quarter, two wide-open corner threes, and missed them both. Would have been huge shots, either one of them. And, yeah, so, I mean, that's my biggest concern. The other cast members, I think, are going to be okay. I think Jake Milton is, is proving that he can help, especially from a scoring standpoint. He can help shoulder that low with Joel Embiid. I think – Ben Simmons is going to get more comfortable. You saw him after the game working out with Dwight Howard, trying to get more shots up and get more comfortable in that role. And, and again, Seth Curry, I expect to just keep getting better and better. So I, I think there is enough help uh, around him once everybody's right. But, again, to, I'll just keep pressing on that. I think Tobias Harris is my biggest concern right now. Paul Hudrick joining us here on the Boardwalk on the hotline on 97.3 ESPN or 76ers Insider. Check out his latest takeaways from the game last night over at 97.3 ESPN.com and the free 97.3 ESPN mobile app at Paul Hudrick on Twitter. Paul, you mentioned Joy Howard a little bit earlier, and I want to touch on him with you. I-, I love what he did in the game last night, but I also love what he did after the game when he brought Ben and Matisse onto the court after the game to get some shots up, get some work in, and it seems like Dwight is intent on changing the environment and the culture on this team. And I think it's interesting because this is the guy that most people would never have thought of would be that guy. But when you really start start thinking about it, he's got the resume to be the leader. Defensive player of the year, multiple-time All-Star, led a band of misfit toys to the NBA Finals with the Magic over 10 years ago. It seems like this guy has really embraced the veteran role, and these guys seem like they're actually willing to listen to him. Yeah, it's and this, you know, uh, you saw, like you mentioned, I mean, Dwight Howard, the resume speaks for itself. I mean, he was the, the best center, the best big man in the NBA for, for a long stretch there. And 
I, I with that, I, I think he had an ego, and I you can understand why because he was great. Uh, you know, again, the defensive player of the year guy, an All NBA guy, he was a great player. And, you know, as his skills have kind of, you know, he still has skills, but, you know, as with anybody, the skills diminish a little bit. And at first he was really reluctant to see, it seemed at least that he was reluctant to take that complimentary role and be that guy. And he, you know, was on like, you know, whatever, I think six, he's been on six teams in six years or something like that. So all of that, I, I think, you know, when you look at the course of his career, from the first time that we spoke to him in Philly, you know, to hear him talk and to hear him talk so glowingly about Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons and what he wants to do for them and how he wants to help them. And it's like the perspective that he has gained is unbelievable to me um, as, you know, a, a, the guy who's been in the league forever. Um, it, it's the, the fact that he's just so willing and wants to impart this wisdom. And, you know, you, you hear the first press conference, you're like, okay, like this is, he's saying all the right things. It's the first presser. Like this, this is really great. But he has continued to be like that all along. And then you see a thing last night, like last night with Ben Simmons and Matisse Seibel, and he's walking the walk. Uh, he, not only is he saying all the right things, but he's doing the right things. And you hear Doc Rivers, you hear his teammates, you know, eff- effusive in their praise for his leadership and the energy he brings. And uh, it's it's looking like that's going to be, you know, Daryl Morey has done a lot of good things, and that's looking like one of his better moves this offseason for sure. I have a question on Ben Simmons when it comes to him backing down and posting up. What are your thoughts on how he's utilized sometimes in in terms of the post up? Because I like when he uses his size to his his advantage at 6'10", but I like when he posts up and then he, he faces up by the end because that's what he does so well. Sometimes I feel in this offense, and we've, we've seen him do that before when it was with Brett Brown. I just don't know if I love all of the posts up that he gets. I'm with you. I don't necessarily love it either. It's not proven to be a super efficient look for them in the past when they, when Brett Brown was here, I think, I don't know off the top of my head, but I, I think like from like a advanced analytics percentile perspective, Ben Simmons has not been a great post scorer and has not been in the possessions generally haven't gone that well for the Sixers when he does post up. And I agree. I, I like a much better facing the basket. Like Doc Rivers has said, going downhill. The one look I've always liked, and it's something that Brett Brown really tried really hard to, to, to really um, to, to, to institute here. And it, it's had mixed results, but you saw it more last night. And again, a little more, more mixed results, but you can see where it would work is that kind of snug pick and roll look, which is basically in the low post, Ben Simmons and, and Joel, Joel Embiid running a pick and roll. And it's a tough look to cover because then you're asking, you know, a big man to kind of, you know, show on Ben Simmons at the rim um, which is not an easy matchup for a big man. He can kind of, you know, maybe blow around them and, and, and get an easy layup. Or you get a switch on a Joel B with a smaller player. You post him up and you get a good look. So um, I, I don't love the post-ups. I, I don't think that's a great look for the Sixers. I don't think that's the best way to use Ben Simmons. But I would like to see him more. And like I said, in those, in those snug pick and roll actions, I like with Embiid. And even in general, I would just like to see him, you know, get more ball screens. And I think – that's something that they, I know he's not, a, you know, he, he's not the most willing shooter. So that's not always, you know, teams are going to play under it a little bit, but I still think you can make it work um, in, in certain instances. And I, I would like to see him play more fish in the basket as opposed to posting up. Paul, uh, speaking of what Ben did, I want to know how much of what we saw from the team last night with the starters offensive, whether it's Ben with the post-ups, whether it was, how they were, we're not up oh, and the, uh, oh, we'll get Paul back in just a moment there, Hunter. We uh, were just having a conversation with him, but his phone decided to drop on us. I did hear that. I heard him drop right off. So, uh, so here's where we're at. Yeah. We'll get, we'll get Paul back in a moment, but go ahead. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I was, I was going to follow up with a little bit of what he was talking about with Ben Simmons. I just, I look at what he can do so well and I look at his skill set, which is very unique. And I just don't know how you, how you watch him play and go, I'm going to keep posting this guy up. Like I get it. He's six ten, and you can use that size advantage, but he's so much better in other ways. Yeah, no, I, I hear you hundred percent. We got Paul back now. Uh, so Paul, what, what I was trying to ask you before your technology decided to hate us here on Christmas Eve, <laughs> not very Christmas like of the technology, but I want to know how much of what we saw last night from Ben and Joel and, all these guys was a byproduct of who was on the floor 
and how could that impact what Doc Rivers does down the road? Because I still have this feeling, not that I have any other real evidence of this, but I still have this feeling that this might not be the starting lineup forever for this season. I mean, de- definitely. I mean, I, look, I, you watched that game last night, and Shake Milton was unequivocally the third best player for the Sixers. I mean, he may, you could maybe even make an argument he was the second best player uh, at certain points. I would say third just because of how good Ben Simmons was defensively down the stretch. But uh, in any case, I mean, there's certainly an argument to be made that Shake Milton would look good in that starting unit as like a secondary ball handler for Simmons. And, you know, again, get more of that offense with when Joel Embiid maybe is getting double teamed hard or maybe doesn't have it, whatever. Uh, But then you could also make the argument that we've seen how Doc Rivers has utilized really good bench guards in the past, like a Lou Williams or Jamal Crawford, and maybe Shake Milton fits into that role. I mean, look at what the Clippers do now. I mean, Nicholas Batum starts, but you're going to like, clearly Lou Williams is the better player and it's clearly going to have the bigger role for them. It's just the way it goes because he's coming off the bench. So it's, I, I do think it, certainly nothing set in, set in stone. I mean, this is one of, of 72 games. So Doc Rivers is going to have options. He's going to have time to think about it. I think what's good is that Shake Milton is pushing you to think that because he's playing so well. The fact that, that this is on our brains, that we're that everyone's already kind of overreacting to one game and saying, yes, get Shake Milton in the starting lineup, do that right now. That just speaks to how good Shake looks. So I think that's a positive. Um, I do think he's going to let it ride a little bit. I think he wants to see how this looks for a little bit. Plus, that bench unit just looks really good. So do you want to sacrifice that bench unit looking good to, 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 to jumpstart the starting unit? Because it's, it's kind of like, like a catch-22 thing with that in that regard. So I would say I think Doc Rivers is going to ride this out for a little bit, but it's definitely not set in stone. And I could certainly see Shake Milton maybe forcing his way into the starting lineup at some point. He's Paul Hudrick, our 76ers insider for 97.3 ESPN.com. Follow him on Twitter at Paul Hudrick. Check out his latest key takeaways from the Sixers game at 97.3 ESPN.com, the 97.3 ESPN mobile app. And make sure you go subscribe and download the latest episode of Coming In for a Landing podcast that Paul hosts as all guests he appeared on the Boardwalk Kind of Hotline. Paul, appreciate the time and the information. Absolutely, guys. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you.